Uh, thank you very much, Kirsty, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you again at another ICAS event. Uh, I spoke to your conference some time ago, and it's um, a welcome opportunity to be back here today and to uh, cover some uh, different ground to the ground that I covered um, in the conference um, that when I was last here. Uh, when we focused on many of the structural issues around Scottish independence and the arguments, and today I want to talk about the economic opportunities. And believe you me, I, I could certainly see plenty of economic opportunities as we uh, took a very slow journey into Edinburgh this morning around the Royal Highland Agricultural Show. So if there's going to be some bumper economic activity in Scotland that will be happening at Ingolston today with the volume of people that were going there this morning, hence my slightly late arrival for tonight, uh, today's conference, but it's a pleasure to be with you um, once again. Ladies and gentlemen, an independent Scotland um, can start life as in as strong a point as any new democracy would have enjoyed at any point in history. In the last two weeks, we've seen a string of very clear indicators of the fundamental strength of Scotland's position and our economy. Last week's employment figures indicated that Scotland has the highest employment rate at 73.4% and the lowest inactivity rate at 21.3% of all four United Kingdom nations. At 6.6% the unemployment rate in Scotland is equal to that in the UK as a whole um, as well as in England and Wales. The, uh, I'm sorry I've got to mention this next bit, Ernst & Young's uh, Investment Attractiveness Survey reported that during 2013 Scotland attracted 82 global foreign direct investment projects, an increase of 8% on the previous year's figure and only six short of the record number of 88 recorded in 1997. Indeed the figure for 2013 was the highest number of projects since 1997. Further evidence of continued investment was also evident in data from Registers of Scotland, which showed that commercial sales volumes in 2013-14 are the highest since 2007-08 and are up 19.8% compared with 2012-13. Um, the business survey evidence remains positive. The Bank of Scotland PMI for May indicated that private sector output in Scotland expanded for the 20th consecutive month with growth in both services and manufacturing, as well as in employment. And statistics from Visit Britain showed that tourist spending in Scotland increased by 20% between 2012 and 2013. And we know that these recent indicators also reflect the strong fundamentals that characterise the Scottish economy. Excluding North Sea oil and gas, output per head in Scotland is the third highest of the UK countries and regions, behind only London and the South East. And the size of the UK economy is almost the same per head as the UK. Internationally, Scotland would have the 14th highest levels of GDP per capita in the OECD ranked four places above the United Kingdom. And our fiscal analysis published last month made clear that Scotland's public finances in 2016 will be similar to or stronger than both the UK and the G7 industrialised nations as a whole. These projections for the public finances show that in 2016-17 also that debt will be falling as a share of GDP. Even if every penny of oil and gas revenues were excluded from Scotland's national accounts, then the tax revenues per head are broadly in line with the UK's as a whole. Once the bonus of oil revenues is accounted for, this equates to Scotland generating more than we would be expected at 9.1% of UK tax, with 8.3% of the population in 2012-13. In fact, Scotland has raised more in tax per head than the UK in every one of the last 33 years. So the evidence shows that we would begin life as an independent nation from a very strong starting point. We also have huge potential in terms of our immense natural resources and the wealth of our human talent. We have thriving growth sectors such as food and drink, life sciences, creative industries, tourism, financial services and many others. Scotland is one of the richest energy nations in Europe. We produce six times our current demand for oil and three times our demand for gas. We have extraordinary potential in renewable energy, including a quarter of Europe's offshore wind and tidal potential. We have more top universities per head of population than any other country in the world. We have a strong record in attracting investment and a reputation for excellence in science and engineering. Our aspiration is to build from this base to create an economy driven by investment, innovation and a broad industrial base geared to establish a fairer society. And that leads into what I want to talk about today, which is why I believe we should make a positive case in this year's referendum, precisely to allow Scotland to fulfil that aspiration. 
Independence presents a unique chance for Scotland to maximise its economic potential, to develop our economy in line with our strengths and our preferences, to manage our international standing and profile, and to have a just welfare system that supports people into employment and, crucially, participation into the economy. The case for independence rests on a simple, intuitive and compelling promise. The people who care most about Scotland and have the biggest stake in our country's success are best placed to take decisions about Scotland's future. That's the people who live, work, study and operate businesses here in Scotland. Confirmation of this is evident in the progress that has been made uh, by the successive Scottish Government since devolution in the 15 years since we uh, assembled in this building to embark on the work of the Scottish Parliament. Since 1999, full-time weekly pay has increased from 5% below UK levels to within 2%. Productivity has improved from 4% below the UK level to 1% above the UK level. And Scotland's employment rate has moved from a position of 2.6 percentage points below the UK to 0.5 percentage points higher. So even with the limited powers that we have over the economy within the devolved settlement, we have been able to create a better economic performance by choosing policies that are correct for the people of Scotland and correct as the economic steps to be taken forward uh, by our country. That's evidence in our approach on education and skills with a focus on creating opportunities for all of our 16 to 19 year olds, the uh, access to higher education that we have established on a free basis and the importance of ensuring active participation through the uh, resurrection and development of the modern apprenticeship system in Scotland. Through our enterprise agencies, which now have no equivalent across the United Kingdom, we've been able to grow our key sectors and also through the work of Scottish Development International to uh, punch significantly above our weight in terms of the attraction of foreign direct investment into Scotland. And we have, as far as is possible under the current settlement, attempted to take a different course on economic issues, such as the issue of capital investment, where our capital budget has been reduced by the UK Government by 26% since 2010-11, but where, over the course of the financial years from 2013-14 to 2015-16, we've been able to circumvent those challenges to invest £11.8 billion pounds um, in the Scottish economy, recognising the primacy of capital investment, an issue of significant departure in economic policy between ourselves and the United Kingdom Government. Uh, since the creation of the Scottish Parliament, successive governments have put in place policies to successfully attract skilled migrants and to create job opportunities in Scotland, for example, through Scottish Enterprises Talent Scotland Initiative and the Immigration Advice Service. Partly as a result of these measures, Scotland's population has grown by 5% between 2000 and 2013, reversing the trend prior to devolution. So I, I cite those examples as evidence to make the point that even with the limited powers of devolution, we have been able to tailor policy to meet the needs and the aspirations of people in Scotland and as a consequence, to deliver better performance for the Scottish economy as a consequence. And if we are able to do that with the limited powers of devolution, my contention is that with a broader range of economic levers at the disposal of a Scottish Government, we would be able to deliver a much stronger level of economic performance than would be the case um, under the current arrangements. Scotland has performed well in comparison to the United Kingdom. However, many comparable interim independent countries perform better, not only economically, but across a broad range of indicators, including equality and well-being. And that is the challenge that Scotland must address. Independence offers the opportunity to transform Scotland's economy and to create a fairer society by making policy choices which better reflect the needs and priorities of Scottish households and businesses. Independence would provide the opportunity to move away from a system of economic concentration and to use the additional levers to deliver economic growth, resilience, fairness, opportunity and sustainability for the Scottish economy. And how we motivate industry and business is key to the success of this approach. We want to create a vibrant business climate based on increased participation and employment, an industrial strategy that aims to create a culture of investment and innovation, skills development and more efficient policy in terms of tax regulation and competition. And I'll set out some of those aspirations in the course of my contribution. In our recent publications, we've outlined a, a whole range of prospective policies to achieve all of that. 
In early November, we uh, published our economic levers paper, a detailed report setting out economic opportunities that independence would open up for Scotland. At the end of November, in Scotland's future, uh, we pr provided a comprehensive blueprint for a successful independent country and summarised the key arguments for independence. And just last week, the First Minister launched our proposals to re-industrialise re Scotland. That whole suite of material focused on the strengthened role for manufacturing as a key aspect of our proposals, um, evidenced by the way in which we could t use the economic levers at our disposal to create a much stronger platform upon which the manufacturing sector could be developed. A commitment to supporting manufacturing by setting an ambitious target to increase manufacturing output by 30% in real terms by 2030 was reinforced by a set of measures to enable that to happen through investment in the, uh, in the sector by the utilisation of R&D tax credits to try to tackle the private sector R&D deficit that exists within Scotland compared to comparable countries and um, where we can see our private sector R&D rate uh, trailing those of other comparable European countries. We also set out measures to improve the competitiveness of Scotland through a more competitive regime on, uh, on, on some of the issues in relation to business taxation, on corporation tax and as evidenced also by the measures that we have taken to reduce business taxation for smaller companies under our existing powers and also utilising the uh, powers of independence to improve connectivity to Scotland and to improve international access to Scotland by a more competitive approach on air passenger duty into the bargain. So independence will give us the tools to take a different course on economic intervention and in economic policy and will also enable us to tackle some of the long-term economic challenges that we face within Scotland. We will be able to tailor economic policy to maximise our strengths and to tackle some of the significant economic challenges that have, been, um, th that have not been successfully tackled to date within Scotland. This government would take an approach that spanned a number of policy areas with the goal of increasing participation, employment and productivity and subsequently economic growth and tax revenues. At the heart of the proposals we set out in November was the transformation of childcare to ensure that we mobilised and motivated a greater number of people to enter the labour market within Scotland. Um, such a policy requires the government to have access to both sides of the balance sheet to, to, to benefit from the fruits of the expenditure in a childcare policy to reap the rewards of attracting the revenues that result as a, as a consequence of participation within the economy um, as a consequence of those economic measures. Another priority would be to look to build on the strengths of our workforce, not just through increased participation, but also through policies around skills and migration. An independent Scotland would have the opportunity to develop a distinct strategy to attract and to retain skilled workers. We would focus on expanding skill development, bringing together employment and skills policies and putting modern apprenticeships at the heart of our approach. We could introduce a points-based approach to migration targeted at particular Scottish requirements and the reintroduction of the post-study work visa would allow skilled young professionals with a real connection to the country to stay in Scotland. However, this is not just about attracting people into Scotland. It would also centre on creating more employment opportunities, particularly for young people, to reduce out-migration from Scotland and to benefit from Scotland's worldwide diaspora as a consequence. These policies would be particularly effective if pursued whilst building on existing collaborative approaches in the manufacturing sector and using this as a catalyst for strengthening an economy-wide uh, economy partnership approach um, with the objective of raising productivity. In our publication, Scotland's Finances, we set out how the utilisation of the three drivers of economic growth that I've talked about, about productivity, employment and population gro growth, can act individually and in combination to increase fiscal revenues and thereby improve the long-term debt position and the fiscal sustainability of Scotland in the medium term. Individually, improvements in these areas could have a large effect. Results from our modelling suggest that a 3.3% increase in the employment rate by 2024 could improve Scotland's fiscal balance uh, by 0.25% of GDP a year by 2029. Taking all of the measures together that we set out in Scotland's finances, we'd have the capability of improving the economic performance of Scotland to have a positive impact on tax revenues 
by £5 billion a year um, within 15 years without increasing tax rates within Scotland, demonstrating that by exercising the powers of independence, we can create a stronger and a more robust Scottish economy. A key part of that must also be how we use the tax and regulatory system to operate in a fashion that provides the incentive for companies to grow and to invest while protecting the interests and the perspectives of the consumer. Both the Institute for Fiscal Studies and our own Fiscal Commission have highlighted how independence would provide the opportunity to redesign the current complex and costly UK tax system and to put into place a system that was much more efficient in response to the needs of consumers and the needs of the Scottish economy. And again, we have demonstrated under devolution how we can use the size of jurisdiction of Scotland to create that more competitive platform. If we look at the uh, relative cost of taxation systems across uh, the globe, we can see the United Kingdom operating currently a, more, a comparatively more expensive um, tax collection and tax management system compared to a number of other smaller countries. So the opportunity to create, through the, opportunity, the, the, the moment of independence, a tax system that was more akin and more in tune with the needs of a smaller country um, are there for us to take forward. We've seen practical examples of this by the uh, steps that we've taken to establish Revenue Scotland, for example, which um, will be integrated with other areas of policy within the, and responsibility within the devolved competence of the Scottish Government at the present moment, uh, designed to minimise bureaucracy and to improve consumer and, uh, and, and system efficiency, but crucially delivered at 25% of the cost that Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs uh, advised us that they would be able to provide that service for us. So by utilising the strengths and the opportunities we have at our disposal, we have the opportunity to create a more competitive tax system. We also have the opportunity to set out our stall on how we want to approach the design of the tax system. One of the key decisions that we've taken in the Revenue in Scotland and Tax Powers Bill is to set out a broad, a broadly, a broad in scope a general anti-avoidance rule to make it clear based on the simplicity of the system that we deploy for tax collection under the powers that we will acquire under the Scotland Act, um, a high level of intolerance to tax avoidance and an emphasis on tax efficiency and tax simplicity as a, 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 as a consequence. In the report of the Fiscal Commission, which the Government accepted, um, they set out the arguments in favour of establishing a tax system that should be based on Scottish circumstances and focused on helping to increase productivity and economic growth. And those characteristics, those driving senses would be at the heart of what the Scottish Government would put in place to design a system of efficient tax collection and tax management within Scotland. We accepted also the recommendation that there was an, a necessity to have cohesion between the tax and the welfare systems so that we had the levers at our disposal to tackle inequality and to ensure that the interaction between the tax and the benefit system always supported our objectives on productivity, participation and economic growth into the bargain. And in the final observation of the Fiscal Commission, we accepted their recommendation and have put this into practice in how we've gone about establishing the tax powers that are coming to us through the Scotland Act 2012 of an open consultative approach with industry, with stakeholders, with expert opinion within Scotland to ensure that as we embark on the design of our tax system, um, we do so um, with the benefit of the input of a wide variety of expert opinion as a consequence. So the, these are some of the opportunities that will arise to Scotland out of independence. And if we seize them, I believe we will be able to meet the economic challenges that we face and fulfil our economic potential as a small, innovative and prosperous nation within the global economy. But to do so, we have to be able to reinforce the economic steps and economic levers that we have been able to utilise under devolution, but to utilise them more decisively to create a stronger uh, platform for Scotland. If we look at the existing uh, financial arrangements of, uh, of a devolved Scotland, um, the Scottish Government could be successful in increasing the tax base of Scotland. We could increase, for example, uh, the four largest onshore taxes by 1%, and we could reduce benefit expenditure by 1% as a consequence of increased employment activity and increased productivity. But if we did that, 
we would see only 12% of the extra revenue coming to Scotland as a consequence. The remainder of the revenue uh, would remain with the United Kingdom Treasury. Out of £350 million of total benefit, £45 million would come to Scotland under the existing financial arrangements. £305 million would be received by the United Kingdom Treasury. I think it's time that we had the ability to put to work in Scotland the resources of Scotland and the successful fruits of the policy interventions that we take forward. And as we embark on a, a crucial uh, part of the debate about Scotland's economic and constitutional future, um, people are faced with two very distinct choices. They are faced with the choice of acquiring the powers of independence and securing the necessary levers of responsibility to reinforce the direction that we established when we reconvened in this parliament 15 years ago to make Scotland a more successful country, but by having the crucial levers to tackle some of the long-term economic challenges that have bedeviled Scotland over years. And the other side of the, of the argument, which you will hear from in the course of uh, the morning that you spend at this conference, um, have not set forward an alternative economic agenda as to how Scotland could utilise powers or deliver a better economic prospectus um, in competition to the aspirations that we have set out in the material that we've put into the debate. And I think it's time that we heard that argument and that explanation from the other side of the argument. For my part, I believe that this is Scotland's moment to take responsibility for the opportunities and the resources and the capabilities of our country and to utilise those to our full advantage by creating a strong, dynamic and prosperous Scottish economy that can work in the interests of everyone within our society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a good 15 minutes uh, for uh, questions. Um, and so I'd like to say there's three microphones also on Twitter. Can we have the first question, please? I've got plenty, but I'm sure. Okay, all of this assumes a benign relationship with Westminster. You make big changes in corporation tax. Uh, you pursue uh, your economic levers. But actually, and you're not really going to be that independent, are you, from Westminster? It, we certainly will be independent from Westminster because what um, Scotland acquires on becoming an independent country is a whole suite of responsibilities that we currently don't have in relation to uh, tax issues, in relation to um, regulatory issues, in relation to wider policy matters and in relation to the steps that we can take to um, create the, the necessary connections that, that don't exist today between the tax and benefit system which enable us to create a better economic future for people in Scotland. And of course we have the ability to manage those resources according to the needs and the aspirations of people in Scotland. But let's say for the sake of argument uh, that there is independence <coughs> and that you are by some miracle allowed to keep sterling. There's going to be some dealing on things like corporation tax, all those things, isn't there? And you're not going to get your way. Well, I think well, when, when, when the Governor of the Bank of England came to speak in Edinburgh, um, you know, I saw Mr Carney's speech before he delivered it, and I thought it was a, a very fair, dispassionate and considered contribution to the debate. And one issue kind of sort of set off within the, 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 the kind of media community was the point that Mr Carney made that... Uh, there would have to be some um, giving up of fiscal sovereignty by a Scottish government to be part of a sterling zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, to me, was a completely reasonable point. It's a point that the Fiscal Commission, um, who had looked at these issues on our behalf, had considered. They said that um, the, there would have to be some agreement around uh, levels of debt uh, that a Scottish government could tolerate, levels of borrowing that we could incur. Uh, I think these are reasonable constraints to sign up to as a consequence of becoming an independent country and being a participant in a sterling zone. Um, and, but, but once we've agreed that, the framework is there for an independent Scotland to take the economic decisions that are within our competence to do so, providing we live within an environment of stable public finances where our debt is at an acceptable level within the sterling zone and the borrowing is in line with the expectations that we'd set out. And of course, those characteristics of a fiscal framework are not, um, they're not new to, 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 to me. They're, a, they're the characteristics of operating within the disciplined fiscal environment I have to operate in just now. 
Um, by law, I have to um, balance the, uh, the Scottish Government's budget. Um, under this uh, framework, we would have to live within a debt ceiling and a framework within which uh, Scotland could operate, and I think that uh, is a is a you know that type of framework is an entirely reasonable and realistic framework to operate within. Now, in terms of growing uh, the economy, uh, um, I mean, you, you've set out you know where we are at the moment, but in terms of growing the economy, particular things that have to be done in terms of increasing manufacturing base, intellectual capital, and all that kind of thing. There is also the question of needing to grow the population. Well, short of putting something in the water, you're going to have to have serious amounts well, of immigration. So something, something has been in the water. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Something that has obviously been in the water. Uh, well, it's even affected my household in <laughs> the bargain, so there's definitely been oh, something no, in the water. Too much information. So there we are, too. I think we'll, draw, I think we'll probably move on there. But, no. but, the, but my, my serious point, Kirsty, is that when we reconvened here 15 years ago, the population projections were for the Scottish population to decline below 5 million. That was, that, that was and everyone was seized by it. You know, Jack McConnell, the First Minister in the early part of this decade, um, put, to his credit, a tremendous industry into looking at the worrying threat of the population falling <laughs> below 5 million. And the population has, it shows you what projections can be like, of course. Um, the population has gone in the opposite direction. Population has been growing as a combination of an improved birth rate, higher than was expected, and also as a consequence of net in-migration. Now, average net in-migration to Scotland in the last 10 years has been 22,000 per annum. If you look at the Treasury's analysis in the, a, the, the a Scotland series of papers, um, they cite that the kind of highest level of growth that you would require in net in migration into Scotland would be 24,000 per annum. So on average, over the last 10 years, we've had 22,000 people um, uh, either coming to Scotland or, or staying within Scotland or returning to Scotland. Um, and the figure that the Treasury believe is at the high end of the estimates would be 24,000. So it's, it's not, not, it's not, not, it's not enough, a, it's it? Not, well, 22,000 is not enough to meet 24,000, no. but, it's, but it's, you know, there's a very modest level of additional in-migration. And in-migration, of course, is a product of a number of things. It's about um, people deciding to come to, to live in Scotland, or it's about uh, people who ordinarily and habitually would have thought that they had to leave Scotland to secure economic opportunity. And we want to create, and my whole speech was about how we create a more dynamic climate to support economic opportunity so, so, within Scotland. So the population is roughly what right now? Five the population point, is about 5.3 million. So how, you know, how do you, what do you want to see the population sitting at in 10 years time? Well, uh, the, 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 we, we, we've set out that uh, population growth of about 5% uh, in Scotland over the next uh, 15 years would be the type of population growth that would support the um, the aspirations in our paper and that level of population growth, growth would be lower than the population growth of the United Kingdom in the last 10 years. Okay, there's a question here and then a question there. Yes, first of all, Ian McWhorter. Yeah, Ian McWhorter, the Herald. Uh, two questions if I may. First, uh, we've had this week uh, the various proposals on Devo Moore Plus, etc., from the Unionist parties, and particularly the Tories, who've made you know a giant leap into the future by uh, promising to devolve all income tax. Now that would they would say would address many of these tax problems that you were identifying at the end of your address there. And and secondly, uh, cross border pensions. Um, uh, we thought that Europe was going to relax the rules on cross border pensions. They're not going to do that apparently. Does that mean that uh, in an independent Scotland? Uh, tax uh, pension funds would have to be fully funded. Um, on the first point, um, Ian, I don't... Uh, well, the, the, the first thing is that I think it's difficult to, um, to work out what the coherent alternative proposition is from the other parties, because as I look at the three uh, offerings, I suppose I should say the, um, well, there, there, are, there are four um, Unionist parties now involved in this debate uh, with UKIP now on the scene, but I'm not quite sure they're in favour of more powers for the Scottish Parliament. I think they're in favour of its abolition, I think, the last time I looked. But if you look at the three propositions of the UK parties, there isn't a coherent uh, line of argument through all three. So I, I think it's difficult to be um, clear about what uh, a potential alternative scenario would look like. Um, it's the first, the first point to make. The second is that... Um, if you look at the uh, point I was making there about um, 
the current financial arrangements. Unless Scotland is in a position where we can bear the f benefit from the fruits of policy interventions that we make by the way in which tax revenues flow into an independent Sc into the, 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 the public finances in Scotland, we will still face the situation that we face, even with the Scotland Act proposals, that the overwhelming majority of the benefits and proceeds of changes in the tax system that we make flow to the Treasury and not to us because of the block grant mechanism. So unless you have the arrangements that I've set out where you have full responsibility to, um, to, 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 to take the benefits of all of those tax changes and to deal with all of the consequences, you will always be in a situation where you don't have the full benefits of those levers at your disposal. Um, this, the second point on, on cross-border pensions. Um, I think the, the, the proposals that I think were widely expected to be emerging from the European Union on cross-border pensions um, and I, I, I suspect will be resurrected. I'd be very surprised if they're not resurrected um, by the incoming Commission. Because at the heart of those proposals is a step to try to do what the European Commission is trying to do, which is to encourage cross-border pension activity. They're trying to make cross-border pensions easier to develop rather than more difficult to develop. Um, so I think the, 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 the thinking and the direction of travel of policy would suggest in that way. Now, clearly, if Scotland became an independent country, and this is an issue that ICAS have raised in one of their previous papers, um, the issue of the fully funded uh, nature of pension schemes uh, becomes apparent. Now, looking at the commentary that's been uh, put in place in this debate, um, I think there is a wide acceptance that there would be um, a, an opportunity for negotiation around the application of that um, particular commitment, given that the purpose of the cross-border pensions provision is to encourage, not discourage, cross-border pensions. But it would be an area in which we would have to embark on negotiation with the European Commission. And if you look at the example for exa uh, when the, uh, in relation to the United Kingdom and Ireland, there was a, a, a grace period was provided to enable pension schemes to adapt to those arrangements. Just, just on the question of uh, the other parties, and you say that it's kind of incoherent. I mean, it, seemed, it seems not so long ago that the argument about what should be in the ballot paper uh, for the referendum was also possibly going to include a Devo Max position, which I understand that, you know, the nationalists were quite relaxed about. So presumably you would welcome the movement, as you would see it from the other unionist parties, towards more devolution. That would be a welcoming thing for you, wouldn't it? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, built my kind of political reputation on, not, on, on supporting any move to strengthen the governance of Scotland. So I, was, you know, I campaigned to get this parliament established in 1999. I voted yes in the referendum in 1997 and I campaigned and agitated to get the parliament established. So of course I welcome anybody who is prepared to commit towards strengthening Scottish self-government because I believe that's the, you know, to go back to my fundamental point, that I think the governance of Scotland is best achieved by the exercise of the democratic wishes of the people who choose to live here in Scotland. But I think we're entitled to ask, what does it amount to? What's it about? What does it add up to? What will it actually be? What is the alternative proposition? And the reason why we were quite happy to have a, a, you know, an alternative devolution question on the ballot paper, we were quite happy to enable that. But the self-same people that are arguing for supposedly more powers were the ones that said under no circumstances will there be an alternative question on the ballot paper. Yes, but we're in a situation now, uh, 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 you know, six months, nine months, 12 months on, where there has been a lot of movement and, and change, obviously. And I just wonder that if the outcome on September the 18th is a no vote, do you still think, will, will you think that Scotland will be in a better position than it was before this debate started? Uh, yes, because I think the debate, despite you know, some of the commentary that goes on about it, I think the debate's enormously healthy for Scotland. It's, you know, Scotland is having to think about what we're about, what we want to achieve, what we want to create mm -hmm. as a country. So I think that's, I think re you know, regardless of the outcome and regardless of you know, the kind of Twitterati stuff which you know I, I deprecate, but you know, 
Well, the Twitter, yes, the Twitter you, attic goes on about absolutely I know, but everything. Just, just but to get it on the record, I'm sure you've said it before, but you presumably denigrate uh, what's been called the kind of cybernet. Okay, I, I have absolutely no time for it. And you know, you should have a wee look at my Twitter feed, by the way, and see what gets put on about me from the other side of the argument and the bargain. So it's not a kind of one-sided thing. It's a product of social media, unfortunately. Yeah. In, I look at some. It's incivility of social incivil media. It's, it's, it's people being prepared to use this medium <clears throat> to say things they would never have I the know. gumption to say to somebody's face. And that's, and I deprecate that in its entirety, whatever side it comes from. But I do think the whole debate has been great for Scotland and Scotland will be um, the better for it. To answer your very specific question, in the event of a no vote, do I think Scotland will be in a better position? No, I don't, because I think independence <clears throat> is the correct answer for Scotland. Gentlemen there. John Brebner, uh, I'm sure we're all delighted to hear about some of the statistics you gave, particularly the one about output, uh, 20, months, uh, 20 months of output increases. I thought it was very good indeed. Um, the, the thing that uh, crossed my mind is that during that period, um, the monetary policy, the fiscal policy, and a strong position in Europe um, are really uh, surely partly to the credit of the UK government. You, and in terms of fairness, would you give any credit to the UK government for the environment during which, on those items, monetary, fiscal and a strong position in Europe, during which those good output figures were created? Uh, what I would say is that um, if you go back to the arguments in 2010 around the economic direction of the United Kingdom, I, I took, I argued for a different course of action to be taken by uh, the UK government in 2010. I argued that uh, they were reducing capital investment in the economy at too alarming a rate. Ours was reduced by 33%. And I couldn't see how you would get the correlation between such a re significant reduction in public capital investment at a time when private capital investment was also in severe jeopardy, still was in severe jeopardy in 2010, how you would secure the type of uplift in the economy that the Office for Budget Responsibility were predicting in 2010. And I was told that I was, you know, I was wide of the mark and that there was no, um, and there's no way that uh, extra capacity could be put into the economy because it would spook the markets. And what we've seen is essentially, the product of that is that output today is 5% lower than the OBR suggested it should have been. So that's, that's the reality of the economic experience that we've had. So yes, I'm delighted that we're in a period of growth now in 2014. I think we would have been a great deal better off if we hadn't had the exaggerated slump that the UK government created after 2010, <laughs> uh, which failed to deliver the expectations of growth uh, and resurgence in economic activity that were planned or expected by the OBR in 2012 and 2013. So I think we've, you know, yes, I'm, 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 um, I'm pleased that we are in a better economic climate just now, but I think we've got to look and reflect on the fact that significant loss of capacity was a product of mistakes that were made in 2010. A quick uh, question from Twitter now. Um, in your speech, you said investment up, unemployment down, sales up, energy up, GDP up. So what will independence add? What independence will add is the ability to improve yet further the economic platform of Scotland, because what we will be able to do is to tackle some of the long-term um, inequalities in our society that are affecting productivity and, uh, and, and participation within the economy. It will also enable us to create um, higher value employment within Scotland, which will assist our productivity challenge by, by creating the best climate for investment in manufacturing and research and development activity. Question on the left here. Jenny Stewart from KPMG. Uh, John, two very quick questions. First, on local income tax. Um, the First Minister mentioned on the radio recently he would like to reintroduce that in an independent, or introduce it in an independent Scotland. Uh, interested in your views on that. Um, and secondly, just exploring the room for manoeuvre in borrowing uh, post-independence. So you mentioned the constraints of a currency union. You've obviously spoken previously around your desire to increase borrowing to pay for an extra 3% per annum spending increase in the first few years. What, what do you think the reasonable difference in borrowing levels could be between a Scottish independent Scotland 
and a UK government which is obviously expecting to have no deficit at that stage. Mm, okay. um, in the, uh, on the question of local income tax, uh, the, the government was uh, re-elected in 2011 on a commitment that during this parliament we would consult on the introduction of um, a, a locally based system of taxation based on the ability to pay and that remains our commitment and we will embark on that consultation before the conclusion of this parliamentary term. On borrowing, the analysis that we set out three weeks ago in the fiscal projections paper envisaged um, taking um, growing public expenditure by 3% compared to the, um, the UK government's plans of 1%, of that would still retain us, uh, it's by 2018-19, um, that would have us in a situation where our, um, uh, the deficit would be 2.2% uh, of GDP, so, uh, but, but still a reducing um, a deficit. Um, and I think that's a sustainable framework within which to, to operate, to have that op the, the source of investment uh, in public sector capital, um, but to operate within a, 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 a responsible framework. And I think finally, Jenny, to, to deal with the point about um, relative borrowing costs, I think we've got to take into, you know, when these, you know, I look at what the ratings agencies have said, for example, they've said that Scotland would be a strong economy and that we would be uh, eligible for uh, the highest ratings that they could provide. Uh, I think we also have a track record. Um, you, know, I, all, all, you know, all the years I've been the finance minister and all the years of my predecessors, we've always balanced the budget. We've lived within our means. Now, people say, well, you've got to do that by law. Well, yeah, we've got to do it by law, but it doesn't make it easy. It means that you've got to take some pretty robust decisions to live within your means. And that's part of the track record. So when people say, oh, you don't have a track record, well, actually, we do have a track record. We've got a track record of um, 15 years of having to live within our means, reflecting my tenure as finance minister and a variety of Labour predecessors that I had into the bargain. And that counts as part of the analysis that would go with the economic and fiscal strengths of an independent Scotland. Final uh, question from the floor. Uh, John McIntosh. You've clearly set out what you see as the opportunities of independence and the challenges facing the economy, but a change in the scale of becoming an independent country will clearly have some risks. What do you see as the major risks and how do you plan to change? Well, what we... We'd, what we'd have to um, establish as a country is the, uh, the most responsible clim uh, climate and platform within which we can uh, proceed to address the, the long-term challenges that face the Scottish economy. Um, I think as I look at some of the estimates and expectations of the economy on, um, um, in terms of the status quo, I see um, a picture of... Um, significant challenges out of arising out of the population issues, out of the productivity, out of the participation issues. And for me, these are the big challenges to, to address. And the question for us is whether we want to acquire the, um, the, the, the levers and the instruments to enable us to do something about that, um, and then to be able to uh, embark on a, a vigorous agenda of ensuring that these measures are taken forward in a, an effective way to deliver the economic returns for Scotland. And uh, clearly, the type of programme that we have set out is designed to expand and to grow the Scottish economy. Um, that is fundamental to the realisation of our ambitions and our aspirations. And what we have to do is to make sure that we take the measures in a, a timely and effective fashion to enable that to, to come about. Uh, finally, John Swinney, uh, you might be aware of a recent book that's just been published by Sandy Moffat, uh, formerly head of painting at the GSA, and Alan Rea, uh, professor of Scottish literature, who says you can have all the economic arguments you want, and there will be economic arguments on both sides until the, you know, the cows come home. But actually, the only argument for independence in Scotland is a cultural argument. What do you say about that? Well, um it would be nice if that was the case because it would relieve me of uh, a whole <laughs> volume of platform engagements to, uh, to discuss the economic issues. I actually have a, well, I have a lot of sympathy with that point of view um, because, I th because I think it actually gets to the, 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 the kind of heart of what we're about and what our aspirations are for our country. And part of our aspirations will be where does our best economic future lie. And that's ultimately what I think people will make a judgment about in this debate. They won't make a judgment, I've said this on a number of occasions, I don't think people will make a judgment on the basis of um, 
you know, I'm going to be, um, well, to, you know, to, to, to use the Treasury's example, several, several Lego bricks better off as a consequence of, in, uh, of being in the Union or okay, not in the Union. Okay, so we're not going to hear any more stuff about every person in Scotland will be £500 better off. We're probably, not going to hear any of that anymore. You will, you'll, you'll probably hear that because that's part of the debate that... Uh, you know, that that, uh, that 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 you've you've raised with me about the kind of the cultural no, economic. Say that again, between no, but, now but, and the eighteenth of September, you're well, not going to give any figures. I, about I'm sure. I'm sure. Will, what I'm saying is that I think the debate will turn on where people see their economic prospects best lying. That's where I think people will make their judgment, and that's not. It's not crudely about. Do I believe this paper that says I will be fourteen hundred pound better off, or this paper that says I will be a thousand pounds better off? It is about uh, looking at all of the information and saying where do I think my country is going to perform and achieve the best, and that's how people will make their decisions. John Smith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Great. Great. What you got?